Chapter 8 of Work, A Story of Experience. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darla Ely. Work, A Story of Experience by Louisa May Elcott. Chapter 8 A Cure for Despair. When Christie opened the eyes that had closed so wearily, afternoon sunshine streamed across the room, and seemed the herald of happier days. Refreshed by sleep and comforted by grateful recollections of her kindly welcome, she lay tranquilly enjoying the friendly atmosphere about her. With so strong a feeling that a skillful hand had taken the rudder, that she felt very little anxiety or curiosity about the haven which was to receive her boat after this narrow escape from shipwreck. Her eye wandered to and fro, and brightened as it went, for though a poor, plain room it was as neat as hands could make it, and so glorified with sunshine that she thought it a lovely place, in spite of the yellow paper with green cabbage roses on it, the gorgeous plaster statuary on the mantelpiece, and the fragrance of doughnuts which pervaded the air. Everything suggested home life, humble but happy, and Christie's solitary heart warmed at the sights and sounds about her. A half-open closet door gave her glimpses of little frocks and jackets, stubby little shoes, and go-to-meeting hats all in a row. From below came up the sound of childish voices chattering, childish feet trotting to and fro, and childish laughter sounding sweetly through the Sabbath stillness of the place. From a room nearby came the soothing creak of a rocking chair, the rustle of a newspaper, and now and then a scrap of conversation commonplace enough, but pleasant to hear, because so full of domestic love and confidence. And, as she listened, Christie pictured Mrs. Wilkins and her husband taking their rest together after the week's hard work was done. I wish I could stay here. It's so comfortable and home-like. I wonder if they wouldn't let me have this room, and help me to find some better work than sewing. I'll get up and ask them thought Christie, feeling an irresistible desire to stay, and strong repugnance to returning to the room she had left, for, as Rachel truly said, it was haunted for her. When she opened the door to go down, Mrs. Wilkins bounced out of her rocking chair and hurried to meet her with a smiling face, saying all in one breath, "'Good morning, dear. Rested well, I hope? I'm proper glad to hear it. Now come right down and have your dinner. I kept it hot, for I couldn't bear to wake you up you was sleeping so beautiful.' I was so worn out I slept like a baby, and feel like a new creature. It was so kind of you to take me in, and I'm so grateful I don't know how to show it, said Christie warmly as her hostess ponderously descended the complaining stairs, and ushered her into the tiny kitchen, from which tubs and flat irons were banished one day in the week. Lawful sakes, they ain't nothing to be grateful for, child, and you're heartily welcome to the little I done. We are country folks in our ways, though we be living in the city, and we have a regular country dinner Sundays. Hope you relish it. My vittles is clean if they ain't rich. As she spoke, Mrs. Wilkins dished up baked beans, Indian pudding, and brown bread enough for half a dozen. Christie was hungry now, and ate with an appetite that delighted the good lady who vibrated between her guest and her children, shut up in the satin room. Now please let me tell you all about myself, for I am afraid you think me something better than I am. If I ask help from you, it is right that you should know whom you are helping, said Christie, when the table was cleared and her hostess came and sat down beside her. Yes, my dear. Free your mind, and then we'll fix things up right smart. Nothing I like better, and Lisha says I have considerable of a knack that way, replied Mrs. Wilkins with a smile, a nod, and an air of interest most reassuring. So Christie told her story won to entire confidence by the sympathetic face opposite, and the motherly pat so gently given by the big, rough hand that often met her own. When all was told, Christie said very earnestly, I am ready to go to work tomorrow, and will do anything I can find, but I should love to stay here a little while, if I could. I do so dread to be alone. Is it possible? I mean to pay my board, of course, and help you besides, if you'll let me. Mrs. Wilkins glowed with pleasure at this compliment, and leaning toward Christie looked into her face a moment in silence, 
as if to test the sincerity of the wish. In that moment Christie saw what steady, sagacious eyes the woman had, so clear, so honest that she looked through them into the great, warm heart below, and looking forgot the fuzzy red hair, the paucity of teeth, the faded gown, and felt only the attraction of a nature genuine and genial as the sunshine dancing on the kitchen floor. Beautiful souls often get put into plain bodies, but they cannot be hidden, and have a power all their own, the greater for the unconsciousness or the humility which gives it grace. Christie saw and felt this then, and when the homely woman spoke, listened to her with implicit confidence. My dear, I'd no more send you away now than I would my Adelaide, for you need looking after for a spell. Most as much as she does. You've been thinking and brooding too much, and sewing yourself to death. We'll stop all that, and keep you so busy there won't be no time for the hypo. You're one of them that can't live alone without starving somehow. So I'm just going to turn you in among them children to pastor, so to speak. That's wholesome and filling for you, and goodness knows it will be a perfect charity to me, for I'm going to be dreadful drove with getting up curtains and all manner of things as spring comes on, so it ain't no favor on my part and you can take out your board and tendin' baby and putterin' over them little tykes. I should like it so much, but I forgot my debt to Mrs. Flint. Perhaps she won't let me go, said Christy with an anxious cloud coming over her brightening face. Merciful Suze, don't you be worried about her. I'll see to her, and if she acts ugly, Lish'll fetch her round. Men can always settle such things better than we can, and he's a dreadful smart man, Lish is. We'll go tomorrow, and get your belongings, and then settle right down for a spell. And by and by, when you get a trifle more chipper, we'll find a nice place in the country summers. That's what you want. Nothing like green grass and woodsy smells to right folks up. When I was a gal, if I got low in my mind, or riled in my temper, I just went out and grubbed in the garden, or made hay, or walked a good piece, and it fetched me round beautiful. Never failed. So I come to see that good fresh dirt is first-rate physic for folks' spirits, as it is for wounds, as they tell on. That sounds sensible and pleasant, and I like it. Oh, it is so beautiful to feel that somebody cares for you a little bit, and you ain't one too many in the world, sighed Christie. Don't you never feel that again, my dear. What's the Lord for if he ain't to hold on to in times of trouble? Faint ain't worth much, if it's only lively in fair weather. You've got to believe hardy and stand by the Lord through thick and thin, and he'll stand by you as no one else begins to. I remember of having this bore in upon me by something that happened to a man I knew. He got blowed up in a powder mill. And when folks asked him what he thought when the bust come, he said real sober and impressive, Well, it come through me like a flash that I'd served the Lord as faithful as I knew how for a number of years. And I guessed he'd fetched me through somehow, and he did. Sure enough, the man weren't killed. I'm bound to confess he was shook dreadful, but his faith weren't. Christie could not help smiling at the story, but she liked it, and sincerely wished she could imitate the hero of it in his piety, not his powder. She was about to say so when the sound of approaching steps announced the advent of her host. She had been rather impressed with the smartness of Lisha, by his wife's praises, but when a small, sallow, sickly-looking man came in, she changed her mind, for not even an immensely stiff collar, nor a pair of boots that seemed composed entirely of what the boys call creek leather, could inspire her with confidence. Without a particle of expression in his yellow face, Mr. Wilkins nodded to the stranger over the picket fence of his collar, lighted his pipe, and clumped away to enjoy his afternoon promenade without compromising himself by a single word. His wife looked after him with an admiring gaze as she said, Them boots is as good as an advertisement, for he made every stitch on em himself. Then she added, laughing like a girl, It's ridiculous my being so proud of Lisha, but if a woman ain't a right to think well of her own husband, I should like to know who has. Christy was afraid that Mrs. Wilkins had seen her disappointment in her face and tried, with wifely zeal, to defend her lord from even a disparaging thought. Wishing to atone for this transgression, she was about to sing the praises of the wooden-faced Alicia, 
but was spared any polite fibs by the appearance of a small girl, who delivered an urgent message to the effect that Miss Plumley was down sick and wanted Miss Wilkins to run over and set the spell. As the good lady hesitated with an involuntary glance at her guest, Christie said quickly, "'Don't mind me. I'll take care of the house for you if you want to go. You may be sure I won't run off with the children or steal the spoons.' "'I ain't a mite afraid of anybody wanting to steal them little toads. And as for spoons, I ain't got a silver one to bless myself with,' laughed Mrs. Wilkins. "'I guess I will go, then, if you don't mind, as it's only across the street. Like's not, settin' quiet will be better for you than talkin', for I'm a dreadful hand to gab when I get started. Tell Miss Plumley I'm a-comin'. Then, as the child ran off, the stout lady began to rummage in her closet, saying, as she rattled and slammed, "'I'll just take her a drawin' of tea and a couple of nut-cakes. Maybe she'll relish em, for I shouldn't wonder if she hadn't had a mouthful this blessed day.' She's dreadful slack at the best of times, but no one can much wonder seeing she's got nine children and is just up from rheumatic fever. I'm sure I never grudge a meal of vittles where her hands turn to such as she is, though she does beat all for depending on her neighbors. I'm a thousand times obliged. You needn't worry about the children, only don't let em get lost or burnt or pitch out a winder, and when it's done give em the patty cake that's baking for em with which maternal orders Mrs. Wilkins assumed a sky-blue bonnet, and went beaming away with several dishes, genteelly hidden under her purple shawl. Being irresistibly attracted toward the children, Christie opened the door and took a survey of her responsibilities. Six lively infants were congregated in the setting room and chaos seemed to have come again, for every sort of destructive amusement was in full operation. George Washington, the eldest blossom, was shearing a resigned kitten. Gusty, and Ann Eliza were concocting mud pies in the ashes. Adelaide Victoria was studying the structure of lamp wicks, while Daniel Webster and Andrew Jackson were dragging one another in a clothes basket to the great detriment of the old carpet and still older chariot. Thinking that some employment more suited to the day might be introduced, Christie soon made friends with these young persons, and having rescued the kitten, banished the basket lured the elder girls from their mud piety, and quenched the curiosity of the Pickwickian Adelaide. She proposed teaching them some little hymns. The idea was graciously received, and the class decorously seated in a row. But before a single verse was given out, Gusty, being of a housewifely turn of mind, suggested that the patty cake might burn. Instant alarm pervaded the party, and a precipitate rush was made for the cooking stove, where Christie proved by ocular demonstration that the cake showed no signs of baking, much less of burning. The family pronounced themselves satisfied, after each member had poked a grimy little finger into the doughy delicacy, whereon one large raisin reposed in proud preeminence over the vulgar herd of caraways. Order being with difficulty restored, Christie taught her flock an appropriate hymn, and was flattering herself that their youthful minds were receiving a devotional bent when they volunteered a song, and incited thereunto by the irreverent wash, burst forth with a gem from Mother Goose, closing with a smart skirmish of arms and legs that set all law and order at defiance. Hoping to quell the insurrection, Christie invited the breathless rioters to calm themselves by looking at the pictures in the big Bible. But, unfortunately, her explanations were so vivid that her audience were fired with a desire to enact some of the scenes portrayed, and no persuasions could keep them from playing Ark on the spot. The clothes-basket was elevated upon two chairs, and into it marched the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, to judge by the noise, and all set sail, with Washington at the helm, Jackson and Webster plying the clothes and pudding-sticks for oars, while the young ladies rescued their dolls from the flood, and waved their hands to imaginary friends, who were not unmindful of the courtesies of life, even in the act of drowning. Finding her authority defied, Christie left the rebels to their own devices, and sitting in a corner began to think about her own affairs. But before she had time to get anxious or perplexed, the children diverted her mind, as if the little flibberty gibbets knew that their pranks and perils were far wholesomer for her just then than brooding. The much-enduring kitten, being sent forth as a dove upon the waters, failed to return with the olive branch, 
of which peaceful emblem there was soon great need, for mutiny broke out and spread with disastrous rapidity. Ann Eliza slapped Gusty because she had the biggest bandbox. Andrew threatened to chuck Daniel overboard if he continued to trample on the fraternal toes. And in the midst of the fray, by some unguarded motion, Washington capsized the ship and precipitated the patriarchal family into the bosom of the deep. Christie flew to the rescue, and, hydropathically treated, the anguish of bumps and bruises was soon assuaged. Then appeared the appropriate moment for a story, and gathering the dilapidated party about her, she soon enraptured them by a recital of the immortal history of Frank and the little dog Trusty. Charmed with her success, she was about to tell another moral tale, but no sooner had she announced the name, The Three Cakes, when, like an electric flash, a sudden recollection seized the young Wilkinses, and with one voice they demanded their lawful prize, sure that now it must be done. Christy had forgotten all about it, and was harassed with secret misgivings as she headed the investigating committee. With skipping of feet and clapping of hands, the eager tribe surrounded the stove, and with fear and trembling, Christy drew forth a melancholy cinder, where, like Casablanca, the lofty raisin still remained, blackened but undaunted at its post. Then were six little vials of wrath poured out upon her devoted head, and sounds of lamentation filled the air, for the irate Wilkinses refused to be comforted till the rash vow to present each member of the outraged family with a private cake produced a lull, during which the younger ones were decoyed into the back yard, and the three elders solaced themselves with mischief. Mounted on meddlesome broomsticks, Andrew and Daniel were riding merrily away to the Banbury Cross of blessed memory and little Vi was erecting a pagoda of oyster-shells under Christie's superintendence, when a shrill scream from within sent horsemen and architects flying to the rescue. Gusty's pinafore was in a blaze. Anne Eliza was dancing frantically about her sister as if bent on making a settee of herself, while George Washington hung out of window, roaring, Fire! Water! Engine! Pa! with a presence of mind worthy of his sex. A speedy application of the hearth-rug quenched the conflagration, and when a minute burn had been enveloped in cotton wool, like a gem, a coroner sat upon the pinafore and investigated the case. It appeared that the ladies were only playing paper dolls, when Wash, sighing for the enlightenment of his race, proposed to make a bonfire, and did so with an old book. But Gusty, with a firm belief in future punishment, tried to save it, and fell a victim to her principles, as the virtuous are very apt to do. The book was brought into court, and proved to be an ancient volume of ballads, cut, torn, and half-consumed. Several peculiarly developed paper dolls, branded here and there with large letters like gallery slaves, were then produced by the accused, and the judge could with difficulty preserve her gravity when she found John Gilpin, converted into a painted petticoat, the Bay of Biscay, oh, situated in the crown of a hat, and Chevy Chase, issuing from the mouth of a triangular gentleman, who, like Dickens' cherub, probably sung it by ear, having no lungs to speak of. It was further apparent from the agricultural appearance of the room that beans had been sowed, broadcast by means of the apple corer, which Wash had converted into a pop-gun with a mechanical ingenuity worthy of more general appreciation. He felt this deeply, and when Christie reproved him for leading his sisters astray, he resented the liberty she took, and retired in high dudgeon to the cellar, where he appeared to set up a menagerie for bears, lions, and unknown animals, endowed with great vocal powers, where heard to solicit patronage from below. Somewhat exhausted by her labors, Christy rested after clearing up the room, while the children found a solace for all afflictions in the consumption of relays of bread and molasses, which infantile restorative occurred like an inspiration to the mind of their guardian. Peace reigned for fifteen minutes. Then came a loud crash from the cellar, followed by a violent splashing and wild cries of, Oh, 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 I fell into the pork barrel. I'm drowning. I'm drowning. Down rushed Christy and the sticky innocents ran screaming after, to behold their pickled brother fished up from the briny deep. 
a spectacle well calculated to impress upon their infant minds the awful consequences of straying from the paths of virtue. At this crisis, Mrs. Wilkins providentially appeared, breathless, but brisk and beaming, and in no wise dismayed by the plight of her luckless son, for a ten years' acquaintance with Wash's dauntless nature had inured his mother to didos that would have appalled most women. "'Go right up chamber and change every rag on you, and don't come down again till I rap on the ceiling, you dreadful boy disgracing your family by such actions. I'm sorry I was kept so long, but Miss Plumley got telling her weariments and peered to take so much comfort in it I couldn't bear to stop her. Then I just run round to your place and told that woman that you was safe and well, along with friends, and would call in tomorrow to get your things. She'd been so scared by your not coming home that she was as mild as milk, so you won't have no trouble with her, I expect. Thank you very much. How kind you are, and how tired you must be. Sit down and let me take your things, cried Christie, more relieved than she could express. Lord, no, I'm fond of walking, but being rather hefty, it takes my breath away some to hurry. I'm afraid these children have tuckered you out, though. They are proper good, generally, but when they do take to training, they're a side of care said Mrs. Wilkins, as she surveyed her imposing bonnet with calm satisfaction. "'I've enjoyed it very much, and it's done me good, for I haven't laughed so much for six months as I have this afternoon,' answered Christie, and it was quite true, for she had been too busy to think of herself or her woes. "'Well, I thought likely it would chirk you up some, or I shouldn't have went, and Mrs. Wilkins put away a contented smile with her cherished bonnet for Christie's face had grown so much brighter since she saw it last, that the good woman felt sure her treatment was the right one. At supper Lisha reappeared, and while his wife and children talked incessantly, he ate four slices of bread and butter, three pieces of pie, five doughnuts, and drank a small ocean of tea out of his saucer. Then, evidently feeling that he had done his duty like a man, he gave Christie another nod and disappeared again without a word. When she had done up her dishes, Mrs. Wilkins brought out a few books and papers, and said to Christie, who sat apart by the window, with the old shadow creeping over her face, Now don't feel lonesome, my dear, but just lop right down on Sophie and have a sociable kind of time. This has gone down street for the evening. I'll keep the children as quiet as one woman can, and you can read or rest or talk just as you're mine. Thank you. I'll sit here and rock little Vi to sleep for you. I don't care to read, but I'd like to have you talk to me, for it seems as if I'd known you a long time, and it does me good, said Christie as she settled herself and baby on the old settee, which had served as a cradle for six young Wilkinses, and now received the honorable name of Sofa in its old age. Mrs. Wilkins looked gratified as she settled her brood round the table with a pile of pictorial papers to amuse them. Then, having laid herself out to be agreeable, she sat thoughtfully rubbing the bridge of her nose, at a loss how to begin. Presently Christie helped her by an involuntary sigh. "'What's the matter, dear? Is there anything I can do to make you comfortable?' asked the kind soul, alert at once and ready to offer sympathy. "'I'm very cozy, thank you. And I don't know why I sighed. "'It's a way I've got into when I think of my worries,' explained Christie in haste. Wall, dear, I wouldn't if I was you. Don't keep turning your troubles over. Get a top of them somehow, and stay there if you can, said Mrs. Wilkins very earnestly. But that's just what I can't do. I've lost all my spirits and courage, and got into a dismal state of mind. You seem to be very cheerful, and yet you must have a good deal to try you sometimes. I wish you'd tell me how you do it, and Christie looked wistfully into that other face so plain yet so placid, wondering to see how little poverty, hard work, and many cares had soured or saddened it. Really, I don't know, unless it's just doing whatever comes along and doing of it hearty, sure that things is all right, though very often I don't see it at first. Do you see it at last? Generally I do. And if I don't, I take it on trust, same as children, do what older folks tell them. And by and by, when I'm grown up in spiritual things, I'll understand, as the dears do, when they get to be men and women. That suited Christie, and she thought hopefully within herself. 
This woman has got the sort of religion I want, if it makes her what she is. Some day I'll get her to tell me where she found it. Then aloud she said, But it's so hard to be patient and contented when nothing happens as you want it to, and you don't get your share of happiness no matter how much you try to deserve it. It ain't easy to bear, I know. If I haven't tried my own way and made a dreadful mess on, I concluded the Lord knows what's best for us, and things go better when he manages than when we go scratching round and can't wait. Try it on your own? How do you mean? asked Christy curiously, for she liked to hear her hostess talk, and found something besides amusement in the conversation, which seemed to possess a fresh country flavor as well as country phrases. Mrs. Wilkins smiled all over her plump face, as if she liked to tell her experience, and having hunched sleepy little Andy more comfortably into her lap, and given a preparatory hem or two, she began with great good will. It happened a number of years ago, and ain't much of a story anyway, but you're welcome to it, as some of it is rather humorsome. The laugh may do you good at the story, don't. We was living down to the eastward at the time. It was a real pretty place. The house stood under a couple of maples, and a great brook come foaming down the ravine and away through the meadows to the river. Dear sake, seems as if I see it now, just as I used to settin' on the doorsteps with the laylocks all in blow, the squirrels jabberin' on the wall, and the sawmill screekin' way off by the dam. Pausing a moment, Mrs. Wilkins looked musingly at the steam of the tea kettle, as if through its silvery haze she saw her early home again. Wash promptly roused her from this reverie by tumbling off the boiler with a crash. His mother picked him up and placidly went on, falling more and more into the country dialect which city life had not yet polished. I used to have been the contentedest woman alive, but I warn't, for you see I'd worked at millinerian before I was married, and had an easy time on't. Afterwards the children come along pretty fast. There was sights of work to do and no time for pleasure, and so I got wore out and used to hanker after old times in a dreadful wicked way. Finally I got acquainted with a Miss Bascom, and she done me a sight of harm. You see, having few pies of her own to bake, she was fond of putting her fingers into her neighbors. But she'd done it so neat that no one mistrusted she was taking all the sarce and leaving all the crust to them, as you may say. While I told her my worriments, and she sympathized real hearty, and said I didn't ought to stand it, but have things to suit me and enjoy myself as other folks did. So when she put it into my head, I thought it amazing good advice, and just went and done as she told me. Lisha was the kindest man you ever see. So when I up and said I weren't going to drudge round no more, but must have a girl, he got one. And goodness knows what a trial she was. After she came, I got dreadful slack, and left the house and the children to Hanretta, and went pleasure and frequent all in my best. I always was a dressy woman in them days, and Lisha gave me his earnings real lavish, bless his heart, and I went and spent them on my sinful gowns and bonnets. Here Mrs. Wilkins stopped to give a remorseful groan and stroke her faded dress, as if she found great comfort in its dinginess. It ain't no use telling all I done, but I had full swing, and at first I thought luck was in my dish sure, but it weren't, seeing I didn't deserve it and I had to take my mess of trouble, which was needful and nourishing, if I'd had the grace to see it so. Lisha got into debt, and no wonder, with me a wasting of his substance. Henretta went off sudden with whatever she could lay her hands on, and everything was at sixes and sevens. Lisha's patience gave out at last, for I was dreadful fractious, knowing it was all my fault. The children seemed to get out of sorts, too, and acted like time in the primer, with croup and pins and whooping cough and temper. I declare I used to think the pots and kettles biled over to spite each other and me, too, in them days. All this was nuts to Miss Bascom, and she kept advising and encouraging of me, and I didn't see through her a mite, or guess that settin' folks by the ears was as relishin' to her as bitters is to some. Merciful Sues. What a piece of work we did make betwixt us. I scolded and moped, cause I couldn't have my way. Lisha swore and threatened to take to drinkin' if I didn't make home more comfortable. The children run wild, and the house was getting too hot to hold us. When we was brought up with a round turn, and I see the ridiculousness of my doings in time. One day, Lisha come home tired and cross, for bills was pressin', work slack, and folks talkin' about us as 
ef they'd nothing else to do. I was dishin' up dinner, feelin' as nervous as a witch, for a whole batch of bread had burnt to a cinder while I was trimmin' a new bonnet. Wash had scarped me most to death swallowin' a cent, and the steak had been on the floor more'n once, owin' to my havin' babies, dogs, cats, or hens under my feet the whole blessed time. Lisha looked as black as thunder, throwed his hat into a corner, and came along to the sink where I was skinnin' potatoes. As he washed his hands, I asked what the matter was, but he only muttered and slopped, and I couldn't get nothin' out of him, for he ain't talkative at the best of times, as you see, and when he's worried, corkscrews wouldn't draw a word from him. Being riled myself didn't mend matters, and so we felt to hectorin' one another right smart. He said something that dreamed my last drop of patience. I give a sharp answer, and first thing I knew, he up with his hand and slapped me. It warn't a hard blow by no means, only a kind of a wet spat side of the head. But I thought I should have flew, and was as mad as if I'd been knocked down. You never see a man look so shamed as Lisha did. And if I'd been wise, I should have made up the quarrel then. But I was a fool. I just flung fork, dish, potatoes, and all into the pot, and says, as first as you please, Lisha Wilkins. When you can treat me decent, you may come and fetch me back. You won't see me till then, and so I tell you. Then I made a bee-line for Miss Bascom's, told her the whole story, had a good cry, and was all ready to go home in half an hour. But Lisha didn't come. Well, that night passed, and what a long one it was to be sure, and me without a wink of sleep thinking of Wash and the scent, my emptins and the baby. Next day come, but no Lisha, no message, no nothing and I began to think I'd got my match, though I had a sight of grit in them days. I sold, and Miss Bascom, she clacked. But I didn't say much, and just worked like sixty to pay for my keep, for I weren't going to be beholden to her for nothing. The day dragged on, terrible slow. At last I begged her to go and get me a clean dress, for I'd come off just as I was, and folks kept dropping in, for the story was all around, thanks to Miss Bascom's long tongue. Well, she went. And if you'll believe me, Lisha wouldn't let her in. He handed my best things out a window and told her to tell me they were getting along first rate with Florindy Walsh to do the work. He hoped I'd have a good time, and not expect him for a considerable spell, for he liked a quiet house, and now he got it. When I heard that, I knew he must be provoked the worst kind, for he ain't a hash man by nater. I could a crept in at the window if he wouldn't open the door. I was so took down by that message, but Miss Bascom wouldn't hear of it, and kept stirring of me up, till I was ashamed to eat humble pie first. So I waited to see how soon he'd come round. But he had the best on it, you see, for he'd got the babies and lost a cross wife, while I lost everything but Miss Bascom, who grew hatefuler to me every hour, for I begun to mistrust she was a mischief-maker, what her's most always is seeing how she pampered up my pride and appeared to like the quarrel. I thought I should have died more than once, for sure as you live it went on three mortal days, and of all miserable creatures I was the miserablest. Then I see how wicked and ungrateful I'd been, how I shirked my bounden duty and scorned my blessed blessings. There warn't a hard job that ever I'd hated, but what grew easy when I remembered who it was done for. There warn't a trouble or a care that I wouldn't have welcomed hardy, nor one hour of them dear fractious babies that didn't seem precious when I'd gone and left em. I'd got time to rest enough now, and might go pleasuring all day long, but I couldn't do it, and would have given a dozen bunnets trimmed to kill, if I could only have been back moiling in my old kitchen with the children hanging round me and Lisha a-coming in cheerful from his work, as he used to for I spoilt his home for him. How singular it is folks never do know when they are well off. I know it now, said Christie, rocking lazily to and fro with a face almost as tranquil as little Vic's, lying half asleep in her lap. Glad to hear it, my dear, as I was going on to say, when Saturday come, a tremendous storm set in, and it rained guns all day, I never shall forget it for I was hankering after baby and dreadful worried about the others, all being croupy and florendy with no more idea of nursing than a by lamb. The rain come down like a regular deluge, but I didn't seem to have no ark to run to. As night come on, things got worse and worse, 
for the wind blowed the roof off Miss Bascom's barn and stove in the butchery window. The brook rise and went raging, every which way, and you never did see such a piece of work. My heart was most broke by that time, and I knew I should give in for Monday. But I sat and sewed and listened to the tinkle-tankle of the drops in the pan set round to catch em, for the house leaked like a sieve. Miss Bascom was down cellar puttering about, for every cag and sarce jar was afloat. Moses, her brother, was looking after his stock and trying to stop the damage. All of a sudden he bust in looking kinder wild, and setting down the lantern, he says, says he, "'You're a brother and an unfortunate woman to-night, Miss Wilkins.' "'How so?' says I, as if nothing was the matter already. "'Why?' says he. "'The spilings have give way up in the ravine, and the brooks come down like a river, upside your lean-to, wash the million patch slap into the road, and while your husband was trying to get the pig out of the pen, the water took a turn and swept him away.' "'Drowned it?' says I, with only breath enough for that one word. "'Shouldn't wonder,' says Moses. "'Nothing ever did come up alive after going over them falls. "'It come over me like a streak of lightning. "'Everything kinder slewed around, "'and I dropped in the first faint I ever had in my life. "'Next I knew Lisha was holding of me and crying fit to kill himself. "'I thought I was dreaming, "'and only had wits enough to give a sort of promiscuous grab at him and call out, "'Oh, Lisha, ain't you drownded?' "'He give a great start at that, "'swallowed down his sovereign, "'and says, as loving as ever a man did in this world, "'Bless your dear heart, Cynthia. "'It warn't me, it was the pig.' "'And then fell to kissing of me, "'till betwixt laughing and crying, "'I was most choked. <sighs> "'Deary me, it all comes back so live "'and real it kinder takes my breath away.' "'And well it might for the good soul entered so heartily into her story that she unconsciously embellished it with dramatic illustrations. At the slapping episode, she flung an invisible fork dish and potatoes into an imaginary kettle and glared. When the catastrophe arrived, she fell back upon her chair to express fainting, gave Christie's arm the promiscuous grab at the proper moment, and uttered the repentant Lisha's explanation with an incoherent pathos that forbid a laugh at the sudden introduction of the poor sign martyr. "'What did you do then?' asked Christie in a most flattering state of interest. "'Oh, law, I went right home and hugged them children for a couple of hours, did he?' answered Mrs. Wilkins, as if but one conclusion was possible. "'Did all your troubles go down with the pig?' asked Christie presently. "'Massy, no, we're all poor, feeble worms, and—' "'The best meaning of us fails too often,' sighed Mrs. Wilkins, as she tenderly adjusted the sleepy head of the young worm in her lap. "'After that scrape I'd done my best. Lisha was as meek as a whole flock of sheep, and we give Miss Bascom a wide berth. "'Things went lovely for ever so long, and though, after a spell, we had our ups and downs, as is but natural to human creatures, we never come to such a pass again. "'Both of us tried real hard.' Whenever I felt my temper rising, or discontent coming on, I remembered them days and kept a taut rein. And as for Alicia, he never said a rasping word, or got sulky, but what he'd bust out laughing after it and say, Bless you, Cynthia, it warn't me, it was the pig. Mrs. Wilkins' hearty laugh fired a long train of lesser ones, for the children recognized a household word. Christie enjoyed the joke, and even the tea kettle boiled over as if carried away by the fun. "'Tell some more, please,' said Christie, when the merriment subsided, for she felt her spirits rising. "'There's nothing more to tell, except one thing that prevented my ever forgetting the lesson I got then. My little Almiry took cold that week and pined away rapid. She'd always been so ailing I never expected to raise her, and more than once in them sinful tempers of mine I thought— it would be a mercy if she was took out of her pain. But when I laid away that patient, suffering little creature, I found she was the dearest of them all. I most broke my heart to have her back, and never, never forgive myself for leaving her that time. With trembling lips and full eyes, Mrs. Wilkins stopped to wipe her features generally on Andrew Jackson's pinafore and heave a remorseful sigh. And this is how you came to be the cheerful, contented woman you are? said Christie hoping to divert the mother's mind from that too tender memory. Yes, she answered thoughtfully. I told you Lisha was a smart man. He give me a good lesson, and it sent me to thinking serious. 
appears to me trouble is a kind of mellering process, and if you take it kindly, it does you good. And you learn to be glad of it. I'm sure Lisha and me is twice as fond of one another, twice as willing to work, and twice as patient with our trial since dear little Almiry died, and times was hard. I ain't what I ought to be, not by a long chalk. But I try to live up to my light, do my duty cheerful, love my neighbors, and fetch up my family in the fear of God. If I do this the best way I know how, I'm sure I'll get my rest some day. And the good Lord won't forget Cynthia Wilkins. He ain't so fur, for I keep my health wonderfully. Lisha is kind and steady, the children flourishing, and I'm a happy woman, though I be a homely one. There she was mistaken, for as her eye roved round the narrow room from the old hat on the wall to the curly heads bobbing here and there, contentment, piety, and mother love made her plain face beautiful. That story has done me ever so much good, and I shall not forget it. Now, good night, for I must be up early tomorrow, and I don't want to drive Mr. Wilkins away entirely, said Christie after she had helped put the little folk to bed, during which process she had heard her host creaking about the kitchen as if afraid to enter the sitting-room. She laughed as she spoke and ran upstairs, wondering if she could be the same forlorn creature who had crept so wearily up only the night before. It was a very humble little sermon that Mrs. Wilkins had preached to her, but she took it to heart and profited by it, for she was a pupil in the great charity school where the best teachers are often unknown, unhonored here, but who surely will receive commendation and reward from the headmaster when their long vacation comes. End of chapter 8 A Cure for Despair